Hey everybody, hope you're doing well today. So in today's video, I'm going to do a, a little breakdown of the track I did last week called Trick or Treat. And um, usually I know I do my breakdowns in three parts, but because this is a shorter track, I thought it would be easy to just do it in um, one breakdown video and basically do all three uh, concepts in a condensed version. So let, let's start right away. Um, you probably noticed in the track, it's it's a little bit shorter than my usual things. It's I kind of treated it as like, you know, a simple idea, um, ABA style, and that's it. And so um, I'll just take you through the harmonic progression just a little bit, uh, because that's the kind of the fun part. So let's see here. So it's basically one, five, one, or that, in that case, that was one, four, one. So I started with one and then go down to B, back up to E, so that's just a classic 1, 5, 1, and then I go 1, 4, 1. So just um, alternating between the perfect cadence and the plagal cadence. Now, one thing I like to do is not always go 1, um, an actual 5, which would be B, D sharp, F sharp, um, because this key of this uh, piece is E minor, the dominant would be B, D sharp, F, F sharp, sorry. Um, what I actually did was I did E minor, then I did a four chord in the right hand and a five in the left hand. So A minor over B bass in the left hand. So that kind of gives it a, an unresolved quality. Like it kind of feels a little bit weird. And so that's kind of what I was going for there. So, oop, sorry. Anyway, that's, that's the idea there. And then in the, Melody part. So what I actually did for this part of the melody is I went from um, the one chord, then I went to F sharp seven, and then I went to F sharp. Um, let me think here. So that's F sharp half diminished seven, and then I went to which is F. 7. So what's happening is there's a constant descending chromatic motion. So there's a B goes to A sharp and then it goes to A. Okay. And uh, yeah, that, that's basically it. So listen, B, G to F sharp, A sharp to A, F sharp, and then it goes, the F sharp then goes down to F. And so you know, there's always something happening in the chords to kind of make it, you know, interesting. And in the melody, um, I, I just wanted to come up with something that was kind of light and comedic in a way, kind of appropriate for a kid's show. And I think um, a melody kind of like that, you know, it kind of, it kind of, it stays within a little bit of a, a range. It's not too, too high and not too low. It kind of stays within. Uh, an octave, and so I think I think it really does actually. Let me think. I think the lowest note here is a B. So right, so B is the lowest note, and the highest note is E. Right here, I'm just using the staccato patch um, from from the Berlin Woodwinds. So yeah, the entire range is not too big. Uh, lowest note is the dominant, highest note is the tonic there. So it's a little more than an octave, not too, not, no, no big deal. Okay, in the B section, um, I start off with a four chord. So A minor, then five of E minor, one, or sorry, four. So I went four to five. Um, now it sounds interesting because the bass drops down. So it starts on A, which is the root of A. Four. Now then I go to D sharp in the bass, so it goes A to D sharp, right? So what I actually did is instead of going from A to B, I just went from A to the first inversion of the five chord, which is actually um, a tritone, which is D sharp. So A to D sharp, or any tritone for that matter, will sound a little bit creepy and a little bit uneasy, and I think that's an unconscious idea. I um. I wanted to apply there. So A, I went down to D sharp instead of just going 
Da, 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 da. Going to be would have been too predictable and not quite, not, not really spooky, you know what I mean? So then I repeat that idea again. Now I got the G sharp minor, and then I'm gonna go up chromatically from here. So G sharp minor, A minor, A sharp minor, or B flat minor. Sorry about that flute there, just didn't hit the right key switch. Uh, Actually, what is this key switch for this flute? See, that, that's why when you're doing multi-patches, you just have to be careful and make sure the key switches are hitting the right um, articulation. This one should be on the legato. Where is it? There it is. There we go. So yeah, as I was saying, um, it goes from a, a G sharp minor to A minor to a sharp minor or B flat minor and then to B major, which is the tonic, uh, sorry, the dominant of um, the key. And then it goes back to the original key, which is E minor. So that's pretty interesting. Um, there's always an ascending motion in that B part. I, will, I really like, I'm really a big fan of uh, climaxes. And so in that case, if I can approach it from behind, uh, the longer, the better for me, or in, in my opinion. Okay, and then the A section, the return, is the identical to the uh, first A section. It's just that I repeat the ending two more times. So. The English horn repeats it, and then both. So you can see right here the solo flute plays the melody. Then the English horn repeats that lick, and then they both double it. Um, an octave apart at the very end. Um, and I forgot to mention that the English horn does uh, take over the, the melody in the verse B, or sorry, in the B section. Um, I think it just gives it a different uh, sad kind of quality. I always think of the oboe and the, and the English horn, their pining qualities really make them beautiful instruments. That's one, you know, that's one of the reasons why they're my favorite woodwind instruments, um, aside from the flute. Okay, let's go into the um, the instruments here and see what patches we used. So some instruments I actually downloaded specifically for this track, like for example, the Ensemble Pizzicatos from Cinestrings. I purchased this library just for this track. I wanted a really close and upfront sound, so that's why I go in with this library. And the Sony stage sounds awesome. So um, it's a really you know upfront and, and intimate tone we get here you know so that's what we used here and it's kind of the bed for the underlying composition same thing for the harpsichord and that one we use in a harpsichord which I just purchased for this library I went for the roomy setting here I um, didn't want it to take center stage too much um, here's the solo flute uh, from Berlin Lubin's expansion B here's the English horn um, from the same library here so what I usually do in terms of programming is I'll play in the melody first, and then I'll manually put in each key switch after that. I'm not the biggest fan of key switches, but if I have to do it, then I will. Um, I'd rather do that than have you know five tracks with different articulations for one instrument. So um, that's what I just find easier at the moment. Um, and then my bassoon is, again, like in my other compositions, like a um, harmonic support. So it kind of sounds like this. And that's from Berlin Woodwind's main library. Where is this? There, that's the bassoon there. Right, so it's kind of a, an underlying kind of morning line there. <laughs> and then I took the bass flutes from Metropolis Arc 2 and kind of gave them a little bit of a kind of let off a bit of a, a pedal sustain kind of thing roll. Right, so it's just outlining at the very bottom there. Right, 
right? So that's their quality there. Now, Saltesto strings, is it Saltesto or is it Saltpaticello? Because my markings are not lined up right now. They're contradictory. What are they? Saltpaticello, okay. You, so you hear that's a very airy and, and almost creepy sound in a way. Right, so I thought it was appropriate for a track like this. And especially in the B section, as we build up towards the climax, I added more layers. Right, creepy. And then I just take it out completely. Um, same, similar function with the violin tremolos here. Um, the clockwork noises I really love, and these are from Time Macro here. So um, let's see if it comes out. So that's the strings, clockwork noises from Time Macro, orchestra tools, and wind noises. Where are you guys? Where art thou? Can I find thou? There we go. I just love the sound of these guys. It's so orchestrally authentic, I like to call it. <laughs> Sounds great. And um, you get that clock feeling. Children Choir is also from Metropolis Arc 2. And um, basically, I put them in the second half of the phrases. So there's a Children Choir in the second half of the A section. And then here they support the chords here when they're trying to build up to the climax. Okay, and then I think one of the coolest patches in this library is the Scream. So this actually comes from the Cinesample's Ancient Bones library, and that is this one right here. So Ancient Bones, it comes with three instruments. I used the, um, the death whistle here, and so it actually sounds like a scream. So let me go do it. Right? It's literally someone blowing through it, but it sounds like a... Uh, Sounds like um, a scream, and I, I did that in right here at the end of the beat. Right, so I think it's kind of cool. Triangle, just a little bit of ding effect. Um, xylophone, I usually hear in a lot of horror, or I mean comedic horror tracks, so I decided to employ it there a little bit. Ding, 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 right? They kind of fill in the, the empty spaces there. Uh, what else is cool? All these other instruments like Glock and Harp, they're also kind of um, tinkly instruments. Okay, tubular bells are the classic epic horror tool. It's kind of like spells doom, but it also kind of is kind of effective and uh, epic heroic kind of music, which I really like. Um, metal clicks are kind of just like the the same purpose a, a snare would serve in a in a rock track in the drums. So one clap, one and two and three and four and one and two. So it has that. Tch, tch, that's what it does. That's all. Kind of like a clock as well. Um, and then just a couple. Uh, the wooden wall is kind of like an accent uh, percussive sound. Right. So, and then low strings legato just emphasizes. The ascending chromatic motion here. Right, so if I play that in context. Right, so whatever I can use to support harmonic movement, I like to do that. Um, and yeah, that, that's pretty much it, guys. And in terms of processing, it's quite simple. I EQ'd a little bit of the instruments, so like the uh, the solo flute, the pizzicatos, and the harpsichord. I did some EQ on each one. Took out the uh, the really low end here um, for the pizzicatos. Took out some frequencies I didn't like here, and then I boosted a little bit of the highs just to get a just to get a cutting through the mix just a little bit more. I didn't want it too muddy, right? Um, and then for the harpsichord, similar idea. I took out all the lows that were unnecessary. I found a little honkiness that I didn't like in this frequency, so I notched that out. And then here in the solo flute, the main character, I took out everything that wasn't needed, and again, took out just a little frequency I didn't need there. So it sounded a lot cleaner to me. Um, I bust some of these instruments 
um, to a reverb. So I did a send to um, ESOS spaces. So I should have named this reverb actually. Let me do that right now, reverb. Um, and right now the setting for that is on the Union Station A hall. And it's, you know, it's an average size length, right? So it's not too long, not too short, but it kind of puts these upfront elements in, in, the, in the same space. And so the instruments that have it, I thought were a little bit too dry and could, be, could use a little bit of help there. And that's pretty much it. And then at the very end, um, I use some tone centric, which introduces a little bit of harmonic tones and analog warmth, which I really like. So I just put that up a little bit. Then I used mix centric, which is awesome from Waves again. And just a little bit of that cleans up the mix and uh, pushes it through a little bit. Um, and then just a gain plugin to kind of notch up the volume because everything was actually very soft. So the overall volume was boosted there before I put on a limiter and took it up to commercial level. So what I usually do there is I go to the climax and then let the limiter do a little bit of, a tiny bit of compression at the very top. So you see that at the very, very top, it just did a tiny bit of compression right there. And that's what I like there. If the limiter can do just a tiny bit, keep the peaks under control, then you know that um, the limiter is doing its job correctly. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. It's a pretty simple track, um, light and comedic in nature again, like I mentioned, and the structurally very simple. So it feels like, you know, it's tied in a little bow um, and it's short and sweet is, is really what it is. Uh, but if you have any questions, please let me know. I'm, I'd love to hear your feedback and uh, yeah, leave any suggestions you'd like for me to do in the future. The next video is going to be super fun. Um, it's, it's a question I get asked a lot, so um, I think you're really going to enjoy that. But in any case, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.